Welcome Bethlehem Church Online family. We're so glad you're joining us today. I'm Casey. I'm Kevin. And we are glad you're here. We know it's a holiday weekend, so we'd love to know in the comments below, where are you watching from? Are you out of town? Just staying home? We'd love to know. So put those in the comments below so I can know. Yeah, we really, we really do want to know. We realize that with a holiday weekend, many of you are out of town. And uh, man, I hope you get some rest. I'm sure you deserve it. Hope you get some time with your family. If you're watching from somewhere fun, and fun may be your living room, but if it's somewhere <laughs> like the beach or, or somewhere fun, let us know. Yeah. Casey will be online this morning. Um, send her a message. And we want to know because we do care about that. Others of you who are watching online, we, we realize that uh, you're watching online because you've got some sickness or some you're recovering from some things in your family. And we just want you to know that we care about you. Uh, we, we pray for you. In fact, as you send prayer requests in, um, each week, many of you send prayer requests in. Those do come through our office. My, me and my team and Casey and others, we spend time praying. We go to God on your behalf. So keep sending those in. Let us know. And just know that we're praying for you and can't wait to see you back at one of our campuses. Others of you, um, somebody invited you to, to check out Bethlehem Church. And so that's what you're doing. You're watching online to start to start out. And we're excited about that. We're honored that you would choose to, to worship with us in this way. Um, hope we get to meet you sometime. But if you if that's you, let us know that as well. Let yeah. Casey know. Send her a message and say, hey, we're just checking this out. If you have any questions, um, we'll do our best to answer those questions. You can also use the Connect card that you're going to hear us talk about in a minute um, to get information about the church. But again, we are really Really glad that you're here and glad that we get to worship together today. Yes, we're so thankful for you. So let's jump into the service. Yeah.
great the chasm then lay between
traditional Baptist church, not actually far from here. And in our church, and it's the same in here too, everybody had unmentioned assigned seating. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I, I can tell who's here and who's not. People are like, this crowd's too big for us to know. I know if you're not here because you're not in your spot. I know. Unmentioned assigned seating. And so there was a family two rows up when I was young. And every time we would sing certain hymns, this, this I won't say her name because some of y'all probably know her. She would stick her hands in the air while we were singing. And I used to sit there and stare at her like, what does she want? You know, she, it's, it's a big question because she's got both hands in the air. So I remember driving home, riding home with my family, and I asked my mom and dad, I was like, hey, why does she stick her hands in the air? And they were like, well, son, that's just how she is. So the only conclusion I could come up with was, she's crazy. And for most of my life, I thought that lady was crazy until I got to college, sophomore year of college, when I first started really pursuing Jesus. And I started reading through the book of Psalm. And Psalm 63 says, I will lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. And I remember reading that verse and I shut my Bible and went, oh, she's not crazy. It's actually in here. So this is what I want to say to you. If, if you are giving God a shot today, you may not have even done church before. But you're just like, listen, we tried everything else, let's try God. And you're watching people stick their hands in the air. I get it that that is the weirdest thing. I know exactly how you feel. But here's what I want you to know. You are not more spiritual by sticking your hands in the air and other people around you not. It's all about a matter of a heart. God looks at our heart, not the outward appearance. But I also want you to know that if you're wondering if you can, the Bible says lift up holy hands in the sanctuary. So you have permission to worship the Lord in that manner. God said so. Let's sing it. Come on, my soul. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Because you got a lion in Woo! Stay here for a little while. Let's sing it again. Come on, my soul. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, lift up your song. Cause you got life. Woo. Come on, let's sing it again. Come on, my soul. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get church. Wasn't that good? Yeah. 
You can have a seat real quick. Bethlehem Church, so good to see you. My name is Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here. I'd love to meet you if I haven't met you yet. But listen, we're so thankful that you're here worshiping with us today, this Labor Day weekend. Especially if you're new, joining us for the first time, we want to especially welcome you. Of all the places you could have been, you chose to be here with us. And so we're thankful for that. And we consider it an honor that you would choose to be here worshiping with us. And listen, we want to connect with you before you get out of here today. We want to meet you. You got some really cool people sitting around you. We want to meet you too. Uh, but the easiest way to get connected while you're here with me in the room, uh, scan that QR code that's on the screen. That'll take you to a place on our website where you can get to know us a little bit better. I see all the things that are going on at Bethlehem Church, a ton of things that are going on. Uh, we're in the middle of small groups about to kick off, so you picked a good time uh, to be here. You can check that out. But there's so many other cool things happening at Bethlehem Church. Get to know us a little bit better. While you're there, you can leave us some information about yourself so we can get to know you a little bit better as well. But we're just thrilled that you're here. Uh, so thank you for being here, worshiping with us. And just as we worship through singing, uh, we worship in other ways. Uh, here at Bethlehem Church, we worship through God's teaching. We also worship through giving. And Bethlehem Church, you are the most generous church on the planet. You you, we know that you believe that when you give to the church, you're giving through the church. And we've seen that play out not only here in our community, but globally as well. And so you are having a kingdom impact when you're obedient to give and worship with us in that way. Uh, man, the things that God does just blow us away. And so we've seen God do amazing things through your generosity. So thank you so much for your faithfulness to give a week in and week out. We know many of you have given online already this week. Thank you for that. And for uh, in the room with me, as always, there's four ways to give. Uh, those are on the screen behind me. But thank you so much uh, for worshiping with us in that way. But you picked a great day to be here. Uh, man, we got an incredible uh, service plan for you. Uh, we've got a really special guest with you that I'm privileged to announce. Uh, he's been here before, and many of you know him as Jason's younger brother, uh, Ryan Britt. I know him as a true friend growing up. We were best buds growing up, uh, going back to middle school days. And so I've got plenty of dirt on this guy, if you want to know. But here's the cool thing. You know, you hear the phrase, God works in mysterious ways. Well, that's true, because here's the deal. I'm the one who kept this guy out of trouble his whole life. And he's the one who's pastoring at a church at the beach, and I'm pastoring right down the street from Fort Yargo. So I don't know how that works out, but listen, I'm thrilled he's here. Great, dear friend of mine. You're gonna love him. Uh, he's, he's on staff at a church called Church of 1122 in Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville Beach there. God's doing incredible things there. Man, just moving in a mighty, mighty way. And so it's an honor for us to get to spend a little time with Ryan today. But we want to give you a glimpse of what all's going on at his church uh, down in Jacksonville. So y'all check this out. What's up, Bethlehem? It's good to see you. I have some of y'all are like, man, this is weird, right? So, like, give it a minute. When I start moving, it's going to get even weirder. The, I am Ryan. I'm Jason's younger, balder, not quite as good looking brother. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. It's been a minute since I've been at Bethlehem. Uh, honestly, the last time that I was here, the last time I preached here, the next day, COVID shut the world down. So I'm gonna try to do better this time, guys. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna try to bring my A game if I can. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm so thankful for this church. I'm so thankful for the leadership here. I'm so thankful for what God's doing in and through Bethlehem Church. It's just always a, a privilege to hear about the movement of God here. We just sang that song a few minutes ago, uh, The Goodness of God, and there's a line that says, all my life you have been faithful. That's really, really good news. Sometimes we say these words and maybe it's just rote or from memory, but think about the statement, all my life you have been faithful, that God is faithful. Even in those moments where I have been faithless, God has remained faithful to me and to you. God is faithful, and the story of Bethlehem Church over the last 13 years is the story of God's faithfulness. And so I'm excited to join the Holy Spirit in the work that he's doing here this morning. If you have 
your Bibles, go to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 12 and to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time. I want to talk to you about God today. And you say, well, that's good news, Pastor, because I came to church to learn about God. Questions about God, who is God, where is God, what's God like, we wrestle with these throughout the course of, of our life. My favorite theologian, a man by the name of A.W. Tozer, once said that the most important thing about you is the thing is what you think about when you think about God. That the, the most important thing about you is what you think about when you think about God. Who is God? Where is God? What is he like? That these thoughts that we have, these are the most formative. These are the most life-defining. These are the most trajectory-giving. These are the most identity-shaping thoughts that we'll have throughout the course of our life. The good news is we don't have to guess what God is like. He gave us his word. And in it and through it, we get to see who he is, where he is, and what he's like. The reality of who God is defines everything about our life. Who we are is a response to the reality of God. And we can't know effectively who we are in this life until we know whose we are. The gospel formula for living is that identity precedes activity. That everything we do comes as an overflow of who we are. Identity matters. Uh, my dad, many of you knew my father, and he served as a pastor for many, many years in Decula. And one of the ministries that my dad gave himself to throughout the course of his life was that he served as the chaplain for the Gwinnett County Police Department. And so many nights uh, during the course of my life, this would happen two, three times a week. My dad's beeper would go off. Do you remember beepers? My dad's beeper would go off or the phone would ring at the house and, and uh, the, on the other line it would be the call for my dad to show up and he would go and mostly what he did was to do notifications of tragedies, families who had lost a loved one. He would go and be a partner to the police department and sit with families in some of the worst moments of their life and he would share the love and the good news of Jesus with them and try to minister to them in that place. As a part of this chaplaincy, one of the things that my dad got was that he got a bunch of police swag. He had the swag, man. He had the shirt. He had the pants with the stripe down the side. He had the belt. He had the shiny shoes. He had the hat. He had the yellow jacket that said police across the back of it. They even gave my dad a gun. And if you knew my dad, that's pretty questionable. <laughs> right? I called him Wild Bill because he was anything but. One of the things they gave my dad was they gave him a couple of the real deal police badges. He had his own badges. So one day I'm 16 years old and I'm walking through the kitchen and I see one of my dad's badges sitting on the counter and I think, huh, that could come in handy. <laughs> but I don't take it, I practice restraint, I continue walking. The next day I walk by my dad's badge is sitting on the, on the counter and I think, okay, I don't know, it's tempting, you know. Third day walks by sitting there, I think, you know what, my dad needs my help. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna help my dad I'm going to hang on to this badge for him, and in case he ever needs it, I'll know exactly where it is. So I take it to my car, I open my glove box, I get my registration, I get my insurance, and I get my license, and I put it inside of my father's badge. Shut, shut it in the glove box, and I'm on, on about my business. A couple weeks go by, sure enough, I'm driving down the road, and I happen to be exceeding the speed recommendation on that specific street that day, and I catch the blue lights behind me, and I was like, oh, buckets, right? So I pull over to the side of the road and the officer approaches my car and he knocks on the window and I roll the window down and my hands are on the steering wheel and he's like, son, do you know how fast you were going? And I look back at him and I'm thinking to myself, the real question is, do you know how fast I was going, right? And I was like, uh, no, no, sir. And he's like, well, let me see your license and registration. I was like, yes, sir. Can I reach in the glove box? And he's like, yes, sir. And so I reach in the glove box and I grab my father's badge. And I go and I open it up and I hand it to him. And as soon as he sees the badge, he recognizes it as the real thing. And he's like, son, whose badge is that? And I go, well, it's my dad's badge. He goes, who's your dad? And I go, well, my dad's Billy Britt. And he goes, Billy Britt's your dad? I was like, yes, sir. He was like, I love your dad. And I was like, huh, me too. <laughs> me too. What a guy. And he was like, your dad's one of the first people to ever tell me about about Jesus, your dad's awesome. And I was like, he is awesome. And speaking of Jesus, how about some grace, you know? <laughs> and he sees that my last name is Britt and, and he closes the thing back up and he, said, and he gives it back to me and, 
And he says, son, you be on your way and uh, I need you to drive a little bit slower and next time you see your dad, you tell him I said hello. And I was like, my man, you got it. Now what happened right there? When this, when this man, when the police officer approached my car, to him I was just another punk teenager speeding, which I was. I was a transgressor of the law. I had broken the law and I had gotten caught breaking the law. And to him, I was just another punk teenager speeding. It wasn't until he realized who my father was that my identity changed to him. Do you have any idea who your father is? You cannot know who you are until you know whose you are. When we catch a divine revelation of who God is, it changes everything about our identity. This is a picture of the gospel. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God in his infinite sovereignty, his divine wisdom and forbearance, he sees children who have transgressed the law, who have broken the law, who have stepped out of bounds, who have fallen short of his standard, of his glory. He sees them, but he does not leave them to their own devices. He sends his son on a rescue mission for them. And Jesus comes to this earth and he lives the life that you and I were supposed to live in our place. And he doesn't stop there. He goes all the way to the cross where he gives up his life and he pays the full price for sins so that sins could be forgiven and that God's children by faith through grace could be adopted back into his family and be restored to right relationship with God. But Jesus does not stay dead. Three days later, he resurrects from the dead and through the power of the resurrection, he now holds the keys to eternal life and he gives it to anybody freely who believes on his name. Here's the exchange that happens at the cross. The only thing that I bring to the cross for, for my salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. I bring all the bad, and at the cross, by faith, I receive all the good that Jesus has earned. That day, that officer gave me all the credit of the relationship my father had earned with him. And the same thing happens at the cross of Jesus Christ, that God the Father gives us all the credit that Jesus has earned through his life, death, and resurrection. We are now robed in his righteousness. We are credited with all of Jesus' good. This is who we are. We're not, we're not our, who, the sins we used to struggle with. We're not mistakes we've made in the past. We're not uh, areas where we've practiced faithlessness. That's not who we are anymore once we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Who we are now are sons and daughters of the most high king. And we have a seat at the table in the family of God. And he loves us. That's who we are. Identity precedes activity. In order to know who we are, we have to know whose we are. Jesus Christ, the fullness of God on display, he is how we know God is good. He is how we know that God's goodness is not circumstantial, that it is a sovereign and historical fact. God is good. And this goodness on display for us is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. One time Jesus in Mark chapter 12, if you want to go there with me, picking up in verse 28, a religious man, an educated man, a scribe or a lawyer comes up to Jesus and asks a very significant question. He ultimately asks Jesus, what's the most important thing in the world? We pick it up in verse 28 and it says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing, this is Jesus with the Pharisees, heard them disputing with one another and seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most of all? What this man is asking is, Jesus, what are the most important words God has ever spoken? God has the ability to create worlds with words. And so this is no small ask. This is not just what's an important question. Of all the words that God has ever created with, what are the most important words he's ever said? What's the most important thing that God ever gave to his children? So what he asked, and Jesus answered and says this, the most important is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one is how Jesus responds. Hear. He's not just saying, listen to sound traveling across waves that are landing on your auditory senses. When Jesus says the word hear, he's saying, open up your eyes, open up your life to the divine revelation of truth. When Jesus makes statements like, he who has ears, let him hear, what he's saying is, this has the power to change you. Listen to it. Ingest it. Die 
just it. And Jesus is quoting the Shema. The Shema you find first in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this is the most prayed prayer in the history of the world. Right now, there are Jews in Jerusalem standing facing the western wall of the Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall. And over, men and women over and over and over again, they are praying the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What does that mean? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. One. He is complete. He is whole. He is lacking nothing. He is in need of nothing. He is one. What I want you to get this morning is that what Jesus is saying, this is not just a statement of priority, it's a statement of placement. What Jesus is saying is that we don't just need to have an idea of who God is, we need to be transformed by the revelation of the reality of God. Most of us do not need more information about God. We need a revelation from God. We don't just need more information. We need revelation. He is saying that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's saying God is first. Not just in priority, in placement. When I was growing up, I was given a list of priorities I was like, if you think these things and you build your worldview around these things, then your life's going to go pretty well. And as I've matured in my faith, I appreciate these formative thoughts that were put into me, and they've been very guiding and helpful. But as I've matured in my understanding of the Bible, I believe that they are lacking biblically. And the priorities that I was given was, if you get these three things right, then everything's going to work out. God, family, and country. God, family, and and country. And while I appreciate the sentiment, it falls desperately short of a whole definition of what God is like and who God is. The reality of it is, is that God is not a priority on our list. God is the one who writes the list. When we say God is first, we're not saying God is first in priority. We're saying God is first in placement. That he's not the one that, he's not a priority on our list. He's not one of the things that our life is about. He's the one that gets to decide what life is about. That he's before there's anything Else, God is first, is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you see this, it can change everything. God is first. He cannot and he will not do second. He cannot do it. He will not do it. The question is not, do I put God first in my life? The question is, is my life aligned around the reality that he is first? It's not, am I putting him first? It's, am I surrendered under the reality that he is first? And if I am not surrendered under the reality of the firstness of God, then my life is out of order. Does my time reflect that God is first? Does my spending reflect that God is first? Do my words reflect the firstness of God? In Colossians chapter 1, it talks about God the Son, who is Jesus Christ, this way, and picking up in verse 5. And it's talking about Jesus, and I want you to catch all the first language. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. Before there was a beginning, there he is. He didn't begin when the beginning began. He was before all that. Before there was a thing, he's first. He's ahead of all that. So he is before all things. And in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. That's you and me. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He is first. And we order our lives around his firstness, or our lives are out of order. This God who is first, the really good news about him is that he's for us. He's for his kids. God is for us. You don't send your son to die for people that you don't love, that you're not for. God is for us. It's just not about us. God is for us. He has just not designed this life to be about, about us. Who and what is at the center of our worldview pretty much defines everything about the trajectory of our lives. Are we living the abundant life that's been offered to us through Jesus Christ, or are we living a life Racked with discontentment and frustration and worry and anxiety. These are questions of firstness. These are questions of preeminence. He is first. And from this position of preeminence and firstness, he, does, he acts out of his character and nature. And so God is first. And from this place, 
He loved first. God loved first. In this is love is what 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Before we ever lifted a finger in the direction of God, he loved us. Before we ever prayed a prayer, he loved us. Before we ever stepped into church, he loved us. Before we ever joined a group or went to a Sunday school class, he loved us. Before we ever made a confession of faith or got baptized, he loved us. Before we ever opened our eyes, before we ever breathed oxygen, before we ever darkened the doors of this world, he loved us from before the foundations of the world. God has set his love on his children. He loved us first. He loved us first. This word propitiation is a really fascinating word. You don't see it a lot in the New Testament. Look at your neighbor and say propitiation. Now one more time, you can do better. Propitiation. If you can order a caramel macchiato every day, you can learn Bible words like propitiation. This word propitiation means the payment that satisfies. That Jesus is the payment that satisfies. He is the payment that satisfies the demands of God's glory. He is the payment that satisfies the full cost of sin for everywhere that we have fallen short of God's standard. Jesus is the payment that satisfies. And this is really, really good news because Jesus paid full price and he gave full payment and God accepted this payment on our behalf. And this is really, really good news. You know why? Because this means that God can never be dissatisfied in you. Jesus has fully satisfied the payment. God cannot be dissatisfied in you because he's not dissatisfied in Jesus. And when God the Father looks at his children who have placed their faith in Jesus, he sees them robed in the righteousness of his son. God cannot be dissatisfied in us because he will never be dissatisfied with Christ. Isn't that good news? Isn't it good news that God's not grumpy? Right? I think about this often. If God's not grumpy, what are we getting so worked up about all the time? Jesus is not just God's posture toward us. He's God's tone of voice with us. My family, we got invited to, to visit some friends who own a place in Montana a couple of years ago during the summer. And so we went and stayed at their place for, for a little while. And um, they lived about an hour from Glacier National Park. And so we would go over to the park and visit. And the first time we pulled into the park, I mean, when you see this place it's just unbelievable. I mean, I don't know how you look on that kind of beauty and you don't immediately go to a divine creator. It's just breathtaking. And as we're pulling into the park, there's this river that runs right down through the Rocky Mountains, right into the, the front part of Glacier National Park. And we see these people coming down the river on whitewater rafts. And our family, we look at each other and we're like, you know, it'd be a great idea for us to go rafting in the Rockies. Let's do it. And so we go to the outfitters and we sign up and we pay all the money and we go to raft and they take you inside and they begin to teach you what you're supposed to do. They give you your helmet and they're like, buckle your helmet up. They give you a paddle and they're like, keep your hand on the top of the paddle so you don't knock anybody's teeth out and make sure your life vest is all buckled up. And when, whenever your raft comes to rough water, make sure that you leverage your feet or you lock your feet into the boat somewhere so that you don't get knocked out. And they tell you this over and over and over again. You get on the bus you ride to the water's edge, you get out, you carry your raft to the edge of the water, and they walk you through it all over again. And they're like, when you come to rough water, make sure that you lock your feet in. You don't want to fall out of the boat. And then they ask you, do you understand? And you're like, yes, I understand. Do you understand? Yes. They ask both my girls, do you understand? My girls are like, yeah, yeah, we understand, right? And they're pumped. So we get on the raft, and we're heading down the river, and we come to the top of the, the most significant rapid that we'll face all day. And here we are. I mostly bring these pictures just because I like showing my family off, but we're having a great time. You see my two, young, my two daughters are in the back. My youngest is on the right, Abigail. She's here with us today somewhere. And then my oldest, Anna Catherine. I just want you to notice my oldest's face. Just look at her. Right? She's having the time of her life. It's going great. We're in the rough water. She's just laughing and having a good old time. Well, we head down this rapid, and we get to the bottom of this rapid, and we fall into this swell of water, and our raft hits like it's in a car accident. I mean, we hit hard. And I, I, I drop into the middle of the boat. Our guide here, she's not jumping. <laughs> right? She's being thrown toward the front of the boat. 
And this happens in elapsed time, like a handful of seconds. But I get knocked down, my wife falls over forward, the guide comes flying forward, and I pop up and I look over my shoulder, and I'm like, where's Anna Catherine? I don't see her. I see Abigail, but I don't see Anna Catherine. And, and my wife's like, I think she's here. And then two seconds, she's like, I don't know where she is. And I had realized that my daughter had fallen over backward into the water. And she had gotten sucked underneath the raft, and her head was actually banging up against the bottom of the raft under the water. Now, I can feel you judging me as a parent right now. <laughs> right? You just keep your judgments to yourself. What do you think I did as soon as I realized this? Yeah, man, I am going in that water. Do you know why? Because that's my little girl. I would die for that girl in less than a second without a thought. There's no question. My little girl was in trouble. She was in the water. I didn't know where she was at that moment, so I was going in to get her. And as I go to jump off the front of the raft, the man sitting next to me grabs the back of my life vest, and he pulls me back in, and he said, she's here, she's here. She had been pushed all the way under the raft, and she was holding onto the rope on the very front end, and she was saying, Daddy, help me, Daddy, help me, Daddy, help me. And I pick her up, and I bring her into the raft, and I sit her in my lap, and I'm squeezing her. She is freezing. They call it Glacier National Park for a reason, <laughs> right? She's cold, and I'm like, do you have all your fingers, and do you have all your toes? Are you okay? And she's like, yeah, you're kind of squeezing me kind of hard, you know? I'm like... I'm like, are you okay? And my wife checks her out and, and she's okay. And do you know what I didn't do in that moment? I didn't sit my little girl down on the front of the boat and be like, what's wrong with you? You can't listen? How many times do they gotta tell you, lock your feet in? They told us over and over and over again to lock our feet in. You, you don't understand English? No, man, I did not act that way toward my daughter. Why? Because my daughter was lost to me and then all of a sudden she was in my arms. As a father, my heart was filled with joy because I had my little girl with me. And if I am capable of this on a finite level, how much more so does the sovereign, infinite God who lavishes love on us feel toward you and me? He is not grumpy toward us. He is not dissatisfied with us. Romans chapter two, verse four says that it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. When the Apostle Paul penned these words, he could have said anything. He could have said it's God's justice. He could have said it's God's holiness. He could have said it's God's sovereignty. He could have said it's, it's God's omniscience. His omnipotence is all powerful reality. His imminence, his gravity. He could have said it is any of these things is what leads us to repentance. But Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, chooses this word. He says it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. The motivation for any obedience in the life of the believer, believer is the fact that God has been kind toward us. God is first. God loved first. And he has been kind with us. He's not just postured toward us that way. It is his tone of voice with us. There's this word in the New Testament that you see over and over again. And it's the word beloved. We don't use this word much. Right? I don't walk into my house after a long day at work and be like, hello, my beloved. <clears throat> I just don't do that. I'd be weird. My wife would be like, no more words from you, right? And so, but the word beloved is an interesting one. When you break it down, it is be loved. Be loved. We go through our life and we ask all these questions about significance. Who am I? What's my purpose? We spend years and years and years trying to forge for ourselves an identity that gives us some semblance of significance in this life. We ask questions like, what's my purpose? As if our purpose is something to do. But I would offer this to you today, believer. What if your purpose is not something you're supposed to do? It's someone you're supposed to be. It's someone you're supposed to be. And what if your highest calling in life is to be loved by God? What if the most important thing about you is how well do you receive and believe that God loves you, that you are his beloved? 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says it like this, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We don't need more information. We need a revelation. We don't need to hear exchange of truth. We need to see truth with our eyes and with our hearts. God really loves us, church. He really does. 
God is first. And from this position of firstness, this placement, he loved first. He acts out of his character and nature. And then because he is love, he created. He didn't create because he had need. He created because he wanted to share himself. He wanted to share his love. And so he created men and women in his image. And from his character, which is to love, he gave. God is first. God loved first. God gave first. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but had, have everlasting life. Do you know how generous our God is? God did not just give us something. He didn't just give us a little bit. He gave us his first and best. He gave us the high king of heaven, the only begotten one, the firstborn, the one who is before all things, the preeminent one. He gave us his first and best. When Jesus had those nail-pierced hands and nail-pierced feet hanging on the cross, he didn't just give 10% of his blood. He gave it all. He gave his first and his best. Do you know how generous God has been toward us through Jesus? Jesus is the exact imprint of the character and nature of God is what Hebrews says. He is the manifest glory of God on the earth. Jesus is truly great. He is true greatness. C.S. Lewis says one time, he said that um, true greatness is revealed not in someone being an extremity, but in them simultaneously being two extremities and filling up all the space in between. What he's talking about is like, it's great to be humble, it's better to be humbly confident. It's great to be self-aware. It's better to be self-aware to the point that you're self-forgetful. Two extremities at the same time and filling up all the space in between. Jesus is truly great. Jesus is the author and the finisher. He is the beginning and the end. He is the alpha and the omega. He is grace and truth. He is judge and savior. He is holy and humble. He is the one who is enthroned on high and he has drawn near. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is truly great. He is the greatest in heaven. It is this great gift that God has given to us. God gave first. God gave first. Ephesians chapter 1 says this. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he has lavished on us. I love that word lavished. Lavished. The only image I can give you to help you understand what God is doing to you right now by lavishing his grace and love on you. This is, what you're, this is what's happening right now. Regardless of how you felt this morning when you woke up, regardless of anywhere you have shame and guilt and hurt in your life, and regardless of how well you've been walking according to the ways of the Lord, regardless of how you feel about your current life situation, regardless of how you feel about how Georgia played yesterday, regardless of any of this, right now in this moment, you are the recipient of God's rich and merciful grace, and he is lavishing it on you right now through Jesus Christ. That's wild. The image I would give you is this. When my girls were small, they used to love bath time. And bath time meant bubble bath time at our house. And I was the king of making the bubble bath. I would pour like a gallon of bubble mix in there. You know why? Because when I was a kid, they put me in a bucket with like a half inch of water and throw a rag at me from the other room. And they'd be like, figure it out. Nah, man. I want my girls to have bubble mountains, you know? So the bathtub would be full and there'd be bubbles everywhere. Do you know where those bubbles were after about two minutes of them getting in the bath? Everywhere. They were everywhere. They had, they had bubbles in their hair. They had bubble beards. There was bubbles on the walls. There was bubbles on the, on the floor. There was bubbles everywhere. My girls were lavishing bubbles all over our bathroom. And God, our Father who loves us, is lavishing his love and his grace on us all the time. And it has an endless supply. God gives generously. The Puritans, when they used to preach the gospel and someone would surrender their life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, they would say that this, uh, they, this person would confess Jesus as the Lord. They would be born again. They would get saved. They would become regenerate, whatever words you want to use. When this would happen, the Puritans would say that this person has now been seized by the power of a great affection. They have been seized by the power of a great affection. Have you been seized by the power 
of God's great love for you? I'm not talking about information. I'm talking about revelation. So what does this mean for us? What does the seized life look like? If God is first and God loved first and God gave first, what are we to do? How do we respond to this information? Well, God gave his first and best to us through Jesus. And how do we respond to him? By bringing our first and best back to him. You say, what does that look like? Well, it looks like trust and obedience one step at a time. We respond to God by bringing our first and our best back to him. We order our lives willfully and joyfully submitted under his firstness. He is first in all things. And we bring our trust and our obedience back to him one step at a time. We respond to him by bringing our first and best. Trusting God is not passive, it is active. It is not just something we think about, it is something we do. And timing and priority matter. In our obedience, timing and priority matter. Delayed, delayed obedience is disobedience. Timing and priority matter. So what are some practical ways we bring God our first and best back as his kids? Well, one I would offer you today is worship. Through worship. When you come to worship, do you come ready? Does God get your first and best in worship? This whole thing here, this is God's idea. The gathering of the saints, we gather together, we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we study God's word, knowing that if we stare upon his word, it transforms us into his likeness. This is all God's idea. When you show up to worship, does God get your first and your best? Right? Do you plan church around your hobbies, or do you plan your hobbies around church? Who gets your first and best? What gets your first and best? Right, when you, we're singing these songs, you guys are a worshiping church, and so I applaud you for that. But sometimes at our church, the, there'll be, uh, we'll be singing these songs about the great glory of God and the shed blood of Jesus and the realities of the gospel, all these supernatural, mind-bending truths that we're singing out loud. And people will be standing there like this, just like, just like they were weaned on a pickle, man, just like. I'm just like, hey man, if you love Jesus, you should tell your face. You should tell your face. Does God get the first part of your week? When you show up, do you show up ready? Does God get the first part of your day? What do you go for first? Do you go for that supernatural connection you have with God through prayer via the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do you grab your phone first? Right row. Is prayer your first stop or your last resort? Is God the first place you go when you're in need? Is God the first person that you give thanks to when there's someone to give thanks? I'm gonna go right to the heart of it. I'm gonna close with this. Jesus says that there's one thing unlike anything else that's competing for human affections. There's one thing that is competing for the human heart against God Almighty that's stronger than anything else that there's one temptation, that there's one idol, that there's, there's one lure in this world that the enemy would use to steal, to kill, and to destroy, to lead us away from the abundant life that Jesus has offered us. There's one particular that is stronger than any other. You say, well, what is it, Pastor? Jesus says it like this. He says, you cannot serve God and money. It is the love of money that it's the number one competitor for human heart. What else in the world are we more prone to trust in for security? What else in the world are we more prone to, to look to for significance, for purpose, that it is the number one competitor for the human heart? And you say, well, Pastor, come on now. Everything was going so good right up until you mentioned money. Well, I appreciate that. When I was in preaching school, they told me, they said, um, my professor told me, he's like, if you want people to like you as a preacher, there's two things you should never talk about. You should never talk about comfort food and you should never talk about money. <clears throat> well, I'm not gonna talk about comfort food today. You know why? Because I have 46,000 Chick-fil-A points on my app. I'm just saying, I got some work to do, man. Some would call it an addiction. I call it commitment. That's it. You know what I call people who don't have addictions? Quitters. That's a whole nother sermon though. That's a whole nother sermon and I'm just kidding. Jesus talks about money all the time. He talks about it a lot. 
because it's the number one competitor. Jesus makes this statement in Matthew 6. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to know what you love, all you got to do is look at where you spend your money. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He doesn't say where your heart is, your treasure will be. He says where your treasure is, your heart will be. He says something goes first and it's not your feelings. Jesus has invited us into this abundant life. You and I are invested in the things in this life that matter to us. The question is not, is God on the list? The question is, did God write the list? When I sit down to order my finances, is it about spreadsheets and percentages and reason, or is it because I've received a divine revelation? Do I go to my spreadsheet first, or do I go to the secret place first and ask God, what do you want me to do? Tell me what you want me to do. I just want you. Who's first? What's first? We bring back to God. We respond to him in every part of our life by bringing back to him our first and best. When we faithfully trust God and we put our trust in his hands, we automatically align ourselves with his character and his nature. God is first, God loved first, and God gave first. God gave you his first and best through Jesus Christ. Do you bring your first and best back to God? I'll close with this. The Westminster Catechism is a doctrinal statement. It says this, that the chief end of man, the entire reason that we're alive is what it's saying. The chief end of man is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Are you enjoying God? If he's lavishing his love on you, are you enjoying it? When you think about your relationship with God, are you enjoying him? Are you living your life like you're just trying to hold angst and frustration and discontentment like it's a beach ball and you're just trying to hold it under the waves of the ocean, not to let it spill out everywhere? Or have you received the abundant life that Jesus has to offer and are you walking in the joy of being a child of God? You say, how do I do that, pastor? Trust him. You trust him. You trust him with your time. You trust him with your talents. You trust him with your treasure. You bring your first and your best back to him and trust Trust is what we bring back to God, and he finds it so enchanting that Jesus died for the love of it. Will you trust him today? Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. Your nearness is our good. We receive the gift of grace through Jesus, and we pray that you would transform us through it. We, we know that you love us, and we pray that you would help us to believe that at the core of our being, that we are loved, and that this is who we are. And Father, we pray that you would help us to see and to believe your gospel and your truth. Jesus, thank you. We love you more than anything in this world. And may it not just be something we say, but something you make true in us and of us. And as we respond to you in worship, would you receive it? And would it bless your heart? We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We pray all these things by the power of the resurrected Christ and in his name. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to respond in worship to the goodness of God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my footman in the fire, time after time.
offer to you for any reason at all. They love to pray with you and for you, especially if this is your first time. I think Pastor Jason is here. Um, I don't know if he's going to be in the living room, but he'll be around. Ryan will be around. We love you guys so much. God bless you. Enjoy your day off tomorrow if you have that off, and we will see you again soon. Bless you. We want to thank uh, Pastor Ryan. Um, it's fun to have him here. We appreciate the ministry he has in Florida, and it's just fun to have Pastor Jason's brother here um, with us this morning. I know you enjoyed that message. Listen. We really want to pray for you this week. If there is a way that we can go to God on your behalf, we want to do that. That's part of our part of our role, part of our ministry here. And there's several ways that you can let us know how to pray for you. Yeah, you can easily just type it in the comments below or head over to the prayer wall on our website. And the cool part about the prayer wall is you get to pray for other people too. And so you get to check that I prayed for you and such an encouragement just to know that other people in this church are praying for you. And so head over there or like Pastor Kevin said at the beginning, fill out the connection card and our staff will get those and truly know that we do pray for you. And so we're so thankful for you and so glad y'all joined us today. Yeah, thanks for being here. And before you go, you just need to know this is Casey's anniversary, her second <laughs> second year anniversary. So if you're still online, send a happy anniversary comment to Casey and we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>